Hi all, I'm Abhin Uvesh Chen and today I'm going to cover uh, a topic called choosing right storage for Kubernetes. Let me go in full screen mode. Okay, so this is about me. I'm an author, blogger, and speaker. I'm an open source contributor. I'm working as a distinguished member of technical staff in uh, Wipro 5G team. So let's see uh, the agenda. So in this agenda, I'm going to cover what is stateful and what is stateless workload, right? And uh, I will also do a quick recap of uh, Kubernetes storage concepts, followed by uh, various options which are there for cloud native storage and then the most important part about choosing the right storage and some of the lesson learned and key takeaways okay so let's get started so what is uh, okay so uh, before we get into stateful and stateless workload it's very important to understand that uh, Kubernetes was originally created for stateless workload, but slowly it has been realized that uh, stateful workloads are also something that needs to be hosted in Kubernetes, right? And uh, what are stateless application or stateless workload? Uh, those are application which are not affected by pod restarts right? so if uh, a pod crashes because pod by its nature is uh, something that can restart and uh, it can get different ip and all so stateless workloads are not affected by those restarts okay whereas stateful workload uh, are something that needs to store their uh, state after pod restart so let's say if there is a database right uh, so we don't want all our data to be gone when uh, our database pod restarts, right? So that is a stateful workload example. And to do so, we need permanent storage, right? And uh, in Kubernetes, uh, there is a concept called stateful sets. Now I want to just highlight a fact that stateful sets are not similar or not same as stateful application. Those are two different uh, things, okay? Uh, some of you might know these storage concepts, but uh, for those who are not aware of it, uh, a quick recap of Kubernetes storage concepts. And I'm not going to go in deep here. It will be at very, very high level so that uh, whatever we talk or we go through next, that makes sense. Okay. So we will just see what is volume, what is persistent volume, what is PVC persistent volume claim, what is storage class and what is host path. Okay, now uh, volume. So volume is a directory, right? Uh, and volume is not a new word in Kubernetes. It has been used before. And there are two types of volume. One is ephemeral volume and other one is persistent volume. Ephemeral volume has a lifetime of a pod, right? So uh, if you restart the pod, uh, then those things will be gone, right? And uh, Persistent volume, I'll cover in next slide. Now, in terms of volume that is supported by Kubernetes, there are many, right? So if you see a quick list here on this slide, so it supports uh, AWS, EBS, Azure Desk, Azure File, Empty Directory. So some of these are inbuilt. They, like Empty Directory, Host Path, are something that you can use. And some some other one like let's say Azure Disk, you will need Azure subscription and Azure cloud access. Okay, so this is about volume. Let's go to persistent volume. Persistent volume, as the name suggests, it's again a piece of storage and it is persistent basically. So uh, like in uh, AWS, we have EBS volume, right? Where if you store something in the EBS volume, 
that data does not go away when your uh, EC2 instance restarts. So similar concept here that if you attach a persistent volume to a pod, right, and then if a pod restarts or even pod terminates, that data does not go away. Okay. And now, how do we create persistent volume? Uh, a quick YAML file is given here, right? Uh, so it's very simple. You just give a storage class name how much storage you want and uh, what is the access mode of that uh, DB. So there are uh, different modes supported, read write once, read write many and uh, uh, read only, right? So, and whether it is host path type or different type, that is again one of the option. Okay, so this is very simple YAML file of creating a PV in Kubernetes. And persistent volume could be static or dynamic what what it means is see uh, if it is a dynamic persistent volume that means we don't need to uh, create it and storage provisioner will take care of provisioning the pv now coming to persistent volume claim so pvc is a way the kubernetes uh, uses the storage right so if I created a PV of let's say 50 gig, then I cannot really have PV shown to pod, right? Or PV is not visible to pod. So PV is consumed using PVC. So when a pod needs a storage, it has to call the PVC. Okay. For that, we need to create a PVC. And how do we create a PVC? As a sample script given here, we just give the PVC name, okay, storage class name access mode and how much is the storage requirement for PVC. Now PVC to PV binding is one to one. And this is very important uh, to understand because this is a major, major limitation. So let's say if I have a PV of 100 gig and I create a PVC of 5 gig, right? And uh, access mode and uh, storage class name matches there, then that PV is going to be bind to PVC. Okay, since we have asked for 5 gig, we will not be able to use another 95 gig. That will be waste. And and there will not be any other PVC that can use that uh, remaining PVC. So that's what one-to-one uh, uh, -one mapping means. And this causes a uh, lot of wastage of storage, right? Because you might not know exact storage requirement, right, in the beginning. And you don't want to run out of storage, so you will typically give a large enough PV and map it. And then if that is not being utilized, then your storage is uh, not really utilized properly. Okay, now so that is PVC. Coming to storage class. Now storage class is like a profile. Okay, so see uh, Kubernetes support, supports different kind of storage, right? And uh, application also requires different kind of storage. Some application requires very high performing storage and and some application where uh, there might not be any need of uh, very high performing storage. In that case, we don't need to really give high performing storage to all kind of workload. We can create a category or profiles of very storage and those are called storage class. So we can create a storage class for let's say high performing storage, one storage class for low performing storage and so on. Right. So these are like tiers. So uh, how does storage class helps? It is useful for dynamic PV provisioning. Right. So uh, one of the example given here, YAML file is given here. So here, what are we doing? Uh, we are creating a storage class, class called CNCF EBS storage class. So this is uh, EBS uh, specific storage class, and we are giving a provisioner. Okay, and uh, and these are just three parameters given, but there are several options, and these options are again not consistent. Different cloud provider, different vendors give different different uh, parameters, right? So you need to find out uh, the right parameters for your volume type and all. So here, what we are saying that uh, my storage class is going to use type IO1, and it will guarantee IOPS per GB of 10. Now, so what is what happens here is when you uh, use this storage class, okay, 
in any PVC, then you don't need to create PV. So let's say the same example where my PVC is of 5 gig, right? And I did not create any PVC PV. So my PVC is 5 gig, I did not create any PV. And now when my PVC is created because the storage class is mentioned, there will be automatic provisioning of 5 gig of PV using this provisioner. Okay. And what is the benefit of it? You're not wasting the storage. And uh, this is still one to one mapping, but then uh, the headache of creating PV and maintaining PV is uh, taken away from you. Okay. Some uh, specific type of volumes and providers give uh, regional replication capabilities right? like uh, GCP gives it and different option features supported by different vendors. So I think that I have already mentioned. Now there is a concept called host path. What is host path? So host path is a way by which you can utilize the storage which is locally present on the server. Okay. Now in this example, if you see this uh, YAML file, it's a CNC of demo PV. So in this persistent volume, okay, I am mentioning host path and path name is slash MNT slash data. Now this storage is coming from my local node. So wherever, uh, whatever worker node is being used, where uh, I'm creating this, uh, it that storage will be used. Now the limitation of this kind of uh, host path is that storage is local right so it is not getting replicated from one worker node to other worker node so if that worker node goes down even though you are using persistent volume your data will go away because underlying storage itself is not available right so that is one major limitation okay and uh, second is that it is not recommended for production reason being it has several security risk right so in our uh, sandbox environment or non-production environment uh, it's perfectly all right to use host path okay but uh, in production it's a big no-no i mean it's not at all recommended okay now let's move on to next part where it is about kubernetes storage options so we have seen uh, why we need uh, storage right how do we give storage to kubernetes workload right so we we give it in terms of pvcs so pod whichever pod wants persistent uh, storage persistent volume it has to have pvc uh, mentioned in its yaml file and then that pvc maps to a pv and there is a storage class option also that we can use for doing dynamic provisioning and that is it. And if you want to use local storage, uh, you can use host path. Let's see the storage options. So this screenshot is taken from CNCF landscape. So as of uh, 25th of July, this is the landscape of cloud native storage. And if you see here, uh, there are like 56 uh, different options. Okay. And all these logos are uh, logos of the company, mostly which provide these solutions. And some are uh, owned by Linux Foundation, like Rook. Okay. CNCF projects, so out of those 56, these six are CNCF project. You can see it here. And out of these, open EBS is something that is used in production in CNCF itself. I mean, that is not the only place, but yeah, it is also used in CNCF as production. And if you're aware about uh, the concept of graduated project, then uh, Rook is the only project which is CNCF graduated out of those 56. Now, a uh, little bit uh, detail about these uh, projects or these options. One, uh, that not all of them are same, right? So it's not like a cloud provider situation, right? Where uh, you take a virtual machine from Azure, it is called Azure 
virtual machine if you take it from AWS called EC2 but they are same virtual machine they are same operate there will be some operating system and storage and so on right they are same but here it is not like that so uh, one example would be let's say MinIO this one right so MinIO is only for your object storage right so you know there are three types of storage one is object storage like s3 object storage and number two is block storage right and number three is uh, file system based right so yeah, these are the three and file system based means nfs is also part of file system so uh, so one of the difference between uh, these products is one that uh, they they are catering to a specific type of storage let's say minio caters only to object storage part some cover all three object uh, so all three storage types like uh, chef okay some are uh, so this is like one difference in terms of what kind of uh, storage options are supported second difference is uh, that i think uh, this can be understood from this slide so there are three types of uh, cloud native storage or kubernetes storage one which is a traditional solution with csi plugin okay so that means let's say netter now netter is there in storage world from so long and to support container workloads or support kubernetes what they have done they have created a csi plugin right so csi is container storage interface which is a standard given by uh, cncf that every vendor has to follow because otherwise there will not be any way to say that yeah things are working right and second is so this is uh, csi plugin is one way so out of those 56 uh, some of those uh, cloud native storage are csi plugins basically okay second is some solutions are software defined storage with container optimization so they have uh, decided so they don't rely on plugin but uh, they have a container optimization so they are as a solution works for container also and they uh, say that they have optimized it for container so it so that it works for container and third category of solution is cloud native solution so there are uh, certain products which were built ground up grounds up and uh, for this kubernetes right so those are like cloud native solutions all three different categories now the question is the most important part is as an architect or as a solution uh, architect for kubernetes i need to decide which storage is right storage for me right how do we decide that so choosing the right storage option is uh, our next uh, agenda in this uh, session. So now in this slide, I have listed uh, 20 such decision criteria. Okay, and you are free to add uh, more, or you are free to skip something which are not relevant to you. But these are more or less something that covers all possibilities. Okay, now let's uh, go through each one of them because uh, this is the most important part okay so whenever you're choosing uh, any storage solution for kubernetes uh, you might end up in a situation where you will have different storage for virtual machines which is like uh, non-container world and container world so now the question here is whether you want two different solutions or one right so ideally you will prefer to have one solution Right? so that you have less management uh, overhead and uh, and so many challenges go away you don't have to really go with two different vendors and don't have to manage two different way of maintaining storage for different type of workload okay so first question that you should ask while deciding any particular uh, storage solution whether it supports both virtual machine and containers second one is as i mentioned before there are three types of storage one is block object and file system so second question would be whether given solution supports all three or one of them or two of them how is it because uh, almost uh, i would say uh, 
I can't give the number, but yeah, most of the solution do not support all three. Okay. All right. Now, third is whether you have enterprise support available. And this is again a, a very common question from uh, open source uh, software perspective, right? So, when you are running open source software in production, you want to be sure that uh, there is enterprise support available from some vendor. And uh, they are there to help you 24 by 7 for all kind of sub one issues and all. All right, number four. So whether it supports major cloud providers or not. So see, uh, these storage options are also applicable for, let's say, on-premise uh, or uh, let's say if you want to run your uh, Kubernetes in AWS, right? Or it might be EKS then you want to know whether this solution will work with EBS volumes or not, right? And similarly, it will work with Azure Disk or not, right? So whether it supports major cloud provider or the cloud provider that is in use in your organization. So that is fourth criteria. Fifth one, whether it provides any kind of replication feature. Why do you need replication in Kubernetes? So you need replication for high availability and disaster recovery, right? So Many solution supports uh, mostly async replication. Some of them are supporting sync replication also so that there is no data loss, right? So based on your requirement, you can decide uh, what solution fits in your requirement, whether if you need sync replication based solution, then that could be one of your major criteria. Okay, so six and seven are uh, types of replication which are supported by various products. Eighth is uh, provides deduplication and compression. And this is again uh, a normal software defined storage feature. We need deduplication and compression. Okay, next one is ease of deployment. Uh, some of the solutions are very difficult to implement and uh, they are all command line options and all. And that is quite difficult, right? When you want to manage uh, your storage at scale, then ease of deployment also matters and many companies also look for workload migration feature right so and what i mean by workload migration is uh, this could be first of all across kubernetes cluster right so your kubernetes cluster one could be running on premise or maybe cloud one and, and you want it to migrate from cloud one to cloud two and you want to do this at storage level right you want to create a snapshot copy that snapshot, restore it, that could be one option, right? Or you might want to have a sync replication where uh, your application is always copied or rather your application data is always copied. So when something goes wrong here, you have uh, exactly same copy available on the other side, right? And you can uh, do a failover to other side. So whether that workload migration feature is there or not. Number 11, uh, whether it supports high performance. Now, how high performance might not be a key criteria for everyone, right? So uh, just see, let's say if you are hosting some uh, telco great workload, let's say some VNF hosting you want to do, right? And there uh, your storage performance and network throughput, everything matters, right? So in that case, uh, you want to be sure that your uh, performance requirements are met. Then uh, next point is point in time snapshot feature because you might want to take backups of your application at time to time and whether is there any snapshot or some other backup mechanisms available, you want to ensure that. Next one is uh, QoS guarantee, quality of service guarantee, like uh, these many IOPS uh, per second, that kind of thing is there or not. Encryption, again, very important from security perspective. So whether it supports encryption at rest, encryption in motion, and for all kind of corruption issues, whether it supports uh, checksum error detection, then whether it's a, and how does the scalability works, right? That's another point. So see, when you create this kind of storage solution, you will be using multiple uh, uh, nodes right storage nodes so let's say you started with three storage nodes and you got uh, 50 50 50 like 150 terabyte of storage now when you're running out of it 
what is the way uh, it works? I mean, how do you scale it? Is it like adding one more node will take care of rebalancing and everything and you will be uh, getting the same performance after that or not? So that is scaling with nodes is there or not? Next is uh, whether there is any infra lock, lock in or not. Right? So sometime it happens uh, where uh, certain storage solution work only with their hardware or certain hardware. Now that is what is lock in. Right? So whether that infra lock in or hardware lock in is there or not, uh, that is again one point that uh, you should consider. Is there any backup and recovery feature? And last one, whether it supports thin provisioning or not. Okay, so as you can see, some of these points are related to security, some are related to software defined storage, some are related to high availability, disaster recovery, some are related to key features of uh, type of storage or type of workload. Right? So uh, you have to evaluate from different, different uh, perspectives. And uh, what can happen here, like how do you really uh, evaluate that so you can create a table sort of thing where you mention all these 20 parameters or maybe more maybe less and then you choose a certain option let's say you choose five option okay that let's say you want to evaluate rook you want to evaluate uh, four more okay you put all five in that same table now you start exploring whether solution one fits in point number one point number two point number three and so on okay and then uh, based on this entire exercise uh, you will get to know which one is the right solution i did not mention the licensing and subscription uh, cost aspect but that is also important some of the lesson learned uh, since there are too many options and uh, if you start exploring all 56 it might be a long term exercise right because uh, you cannot do it theoretically by reading uh, literature that is available in public domain. So you have to do certain POCs. Now you cannot do POCs of uh, 56 different uh, solutions. So one of the recommendation is that uh, at theoretical level you decide right which one in, which five are aligned to your strategy right at very high level. Then start from there. I mean don't start with all 56. Number two, very important uh, lesson that uh, some of the limitation will not be known before end. So, I mean, in many uh, public, uh, publicly available documentation, you will not see a heading called known limitation or these are the things which do not work, right? So, uh, it will happen that once you start using it, you will find out, uh, I mean, there could be multiple scenario. One could be that, uh, uh, there is a feature which is mentioned it is there but actually it is not there it is work in progress kind of thing or it might not be working there are known issues okay so those kind of things you will get to know only when you do the poc so once you shortlist uh, let's say five of them then do a quick poc in some test environment and try to see various features whether i'm able to take backup whether, whether it is uh, supporting async replication is, I mean, you can do those small, small POC. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, subscription and licensing of add on should also be considered in the beginning itself. Right? So, what I mean by licensing of add on, so in most of these products, uh, core functionality uh, is free mostly. Core functionality means the storage fabric part is free. So, you can implement their solution and that will take care of creating a storage pool, doing dynamic provisioning and all those basic things will be taken care of. And you can give that storage to your bots and all. But when it comes to, to let's say sync replication or when it comes to backup, when it comes to uh, even management, sometime uh, uh, some vendors give uh, command line based uh, management free, but uh, if you have to manage using their management portal, then you have to pay. For add-on, right? And it's not substantial amount, but yeah, it is still something one one has to consider. So yeah, that's what I meant by licensing of add-on should be considered. And uh, since you're dealing with open source, uh, Slack channel is the best place to get the support. Sometimes the enterprise supported uh, version also have some support email and all, and you can reach them and get support. 
so these are some of the lessons what are the common challenges first one it's a fast changing area right so uh, i mean if you have done a poc one month ago then you cannot be sure that everything is same now because people are introducing new features and people are uh, fixing bugs i mean a lot of things are happening right so sometime it will be good to find out the roadmap of given product right so certain thing might not be there let's say out of your 10 criteria nine are meeting one is not meeting now you can always check with their uh, if it is open source you can just check in open source community if there is a roadmap to get that 10th feature or if it is supported by any company and that falls under that company then you can ask them if it is part of their roadmap or not that way you can catch up otherwise if only on the basis of nine parameter you reject because you are not uh, i mean that uh, solution is not fitting in your 10 out of 10 things then you should not throw it out number two is lack of support for vm and container both i think i mentioned it uh, in the beginning that very few solution supports uh, virtual machine and container both and the practical experience is that very few company want to go for two different storage solutions right one for kubernetes and one for traditional virtual machine world right third one uh, error prone command line based step uh, i think this is self explanatory and uh, it is uh, it is about uh, i mean you don't want to do first neither you want to do entire management using command line nor you want to do automation on your own to bring it up to a shape where it can be used in production right both are not good so this is again a common challenge lack of application awareness now application in kubernetes is something that is not uh, clearly defined right so there is nothing no entity called application so application is sum of various uh, objects it will have pod it will have deployment it will have uh, uh, some config map it will have some secret i mean and all together is one application right so and the storage which is attached to it uh, when you say i want to back up my application now is this uh, storage solution aware of your application can you define your application can you say that okay whatever is there in this namespace that is my application is that kind of option given right so typically it is not there so lack of application awareness is common challenge and replication and disaster recovery features are something which are commonly missing and sometime uh, async replication is there but sync replication is not there and so on right so these are some of the common challenges okay coming to key takeaways number 1 so out of those 20 uh, criteria decision criteria which i explained the most important ones are enterprise strategy so many companies have alignment with certain storage partner vendor right uh, so that and they want to continue that they don't want to introduce one more vendor one more complex thing in, in the mix so sometimes that itself becomes a single decision uh, criteria right and of course um, unless it is limited by so many features but uh, then that itself is uh, good enough to choose that is like simplest of all case next is enterprise support uh, again very very important and features various features these are three main criteria and features is again uh, uh, i mean it can have several other points right so which feature you are looking for uh, you will try to map with it now next one again a lesson learned and the key takeaway that uh, most of the vendor supported product do not have exact same commercial version feature and open source version and that is uh, obvious i mean uh, that is how it works if if they give exactly same version then what is their value add right uh, so there are i would say as i mentioned before i mean most of the feature the core feature is free and is always given but some of the add on like uh, let's say gui based maintenance and all that that is given as part of subscription 
some some vendors very few vendors give their as is commercial version with several restriction so what they say i'm giving you exactly same product which i give you when you buy my subscription but then this product which i'm giving you giving you for free is not going to uh, have same kind of uh, uh, not same kind of thing i mean it will have certain limitation so it will work only with 5 terabyte of storage it will work with only 10 nodes so whatever i mean those kind of restriction will be there and those are good i mean i mean for non production kind of environment you are good with uh, those restriction right you can still live with uh, those restrictions so, yeah i mean in such cases feel free to use those products in non production give a special consideration for performance requirement because not all vendors stress on performance some vendors are very good in performance and they are performance of their storage subsystem is their key usp and if you are looking for performance then uh, you should consider it uh, right uh, next one end to end automation and gui driven configuration is not available and this is a challenge right uh, if uh, if a mix of gui and command line is given then it becomes a nightmare in real life right and last but not the least no one size fits all solution right uh, so though i have mentioned 20 criteria and uh, you might have uh, maybe 10 more 20 more to be added in that list and uh, you can uh, i mean by this line what i mean to say is that uh, you will not find a single product which will fit in all those 40 criteria you will not find i mean there will be some gap somewhere either it might not be good in performance or it might not be good from manageability perspective or it might not be uh, covering all the features so i mean there's so many uh, ways it is different so no one size fits all solution okay so that is it and uh, this is about my company so i work for wipro we are 8 billion company we have uh, got 1120 active clients this is our employee strength and this is as of uh, fy21 results we are present in 66 countries and with that uh, we have come to end of this presentation uh, so thank you very much for your time thank you